This is Paul Schmid. Welcome to the Pursuit Zone. While in college at Iowa State University, my next guest teamed up to design and install a water valve for a rural Malian village. It was a life-changing experience. After graduation, he volunteered for the Peace Corps in Nicaragua, and while there, co-founded Emerging Opportunities for Sustainability, EOS for short, a not-for-profit organization dedicated to producing technology that is low-cost, promotes health and welfare, and minimizes damage to the environment. In 2012, he was awarded the Statement Maker's Honor from the Iowa State Alumni Association for his early personal and professional accomplishments. Wes Meyer, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Thank you so much, Paul. Wes, what got you into mechanical engineering? Well, I guess it all started when I was a kid. I love tinkering with different things. I grew up on a farm, a small family farm, and obviously my dad kept me very occupied and kept me out in the fields, kept me out outside. And I, that kind of created the interest of, of taking things apart, breaking them, refixing them, understanding how they work. And I guess that kind of led into um, opportunities that led me to Iowa State. And obviously, Iowa State being a great uh, school and fairly close. I grew up in Iowa, um, Iowa State being close, but a great engineering university. Um, it kind of had the path well paved out for, for what I wanted to do. What part of Iowa did you grow up in? I grew in, it was the northeastern part. It's just south of Waterloo, uh, a small town called LaPorte City, Iowa. Hmm. I've never heard of that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty small, a couple thousand people only. There's a lot of those towns in Iowa that I've never heard of. Uh, yes, indeed. That's what I was known for. So tell me about the senior design class project. Yes. Yeah, so this class was called Appropriate Technology Design. Um, basically, it's an opportunity for students to really just understand what human-centered design is and how to, um, I guess, take engineering, um, the concept of engineering, and utilize it in making a difference in, in a different environment. Um, this environment was the developing world, and we focused on Mali, Africa. Um, so it was, a, it was actually a senior design course and started off learning basics about understanding you know, the, the process of, of um, engineering, understanding the design, understanding the, the audience, understanding the, the characteristics you need to have to make appropriate design and how to make it work properly. Um, and obviously, the hardest part for us was understanding the, um, what the problem is. And so we were tasked with, a, with some help from the professor and other people who have been to Mali, um, deciding that uh, they have installed already a established water coordination or a water, um, excuse me, a water system, utilizing a tank and um, a series of solar pumps and then valves at the very end. Um, these valves were Chinese made and very cheap. They were the only ones that were available and they leaked. So it kind of defeated the whole purpose when you have this amazing system installed and, and working, but the valves leak and leaking water all day, losing awesome, very clean water that people could, um, you know, would be stored and they could use. So our task was to design a water valve that is appropriate for its audience, appropriate for the, the, the culture, the climate, um, has, utilizes local materials, uh, kind of in general, something that, that would make sense that people would, would use. And I guess throughout the whole semester, um, came up with, you know, various ideas, various prototypes. And we had a team of five of us, in, uh, senior mechanical engineers, came with the final design, made a cool prototype out of wood. And ultimately, we were, we were uh, lucky enough, I was lucky enough to actually take the design with me to Mali, Africa, and spend a couple, uh, couple of months um, trying to incorporate this design into, into practice. Did any other team members go along with you? So there's one other team member, Greg McGrath, who I know we're going to talk about a little bit later as well, um, another uh, founder of EOS, but um, another team member at the time, uh, yes, uh, the two of us along with other students um, that were working on different projects as well. I think there's a total of uh, six students and a professor and, potential, and a grad student. Tell me about that experience in Mali. Eye-opening. Absolutely eye-opening. This was, I did a study abroad before, so I had been out of the country and understood what, I guess, what other people think of America, and it's, that was truly eye-opening in that experience, but going to Mali was a whole other step, a completely different level of, of standard of living. The basic uh, food staple was millet, 
and people were mixed millet um, that was ground up, made kind of like a porridge, kind of like just a really dull oatmeal. And they added peanuts to add some protein to their to their diet. Um, but that was a that's what people would eat three times a day: uh, a mixture of millet and and peanuts. So did you? Obviously, were you stuck eating that diet as well? So we were we were lucky enough to have a little better uh, access to a little bit more food. So we were living. We had um, some vegetables every once in a while. Um, and actually, there's a local baker utilize a, a really cool traditional oven, just a big kind of a mud igloo that they heat up on the inside with with fire and they had some flour and made bread and baked it and so we also had bread so we did uh, we were lucky enough i'd say you know i ate, ate very healthily um definitely better than than most people do on an average day did you live in a tent did you have uh, some kind of structure how did that work well, yes yeah so this so the village that we stayed in was about three hours outside of the capital um, it was about an hour on a brand new paved road, um, I think funded by the Millennium Challenge Corporation. And after that hour ride drive, uh, we had another two hours on a bumpy road. And really, and realistically, it would have only been maybe a half an hour, maybe an hour drive here in, in uh, the U.S. But there, it was relatively small, but just so bumpy, so hilly, going over big rocks. So we were really kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And so obviously no access to electricity or anything. Um, they did have, however, um, some type of a compound created or built. This was, uh, we were the first student group to come down there on this exchange, but there have been other, um, I guess, other groups there that weren't students that have stayed there. So it's kind of starting to be an established program. So we were lucky enough to stay in some type of a compound. Um, but again, standard of living, people were living in, in mud huts, usually round huts, and they're, you know, configured with five or six of these huts kind of in one big circle. And that was like their family and extended family. So they had that kind of support circle. And so it'd be, you know, in our community that we were saying about a thousand people, um, there would be, you know, maybe 20 or so um, different rings of extended family members living together. Is it desert-like? Is Are there trees? What's the landscape? Yes. So it, in Mali, it was six months of dry season, six months of rain. So we were coming then on the very end of the dry season. So as you can see, everything was just pure dust. We went for a run. And there's at least an inch of dust all over. You walk on it, just puffs off at you because it hasn't rained for six months. Um, towards the end of our stay, though, it actually started raining. And when it rains, it pours. And it was pretty awesome um, kind of experiencing that and seeing everybody so happy because now people can start planting crops and it's the start of a new season. But it, yes, during the dry parts, it was it was like a desert. Um, these huge, there's a huge area where there's a huge flowing river. As they said, there was a huge flowing river. But when we were there, you know, we walked through it. They said they had water up 10 feet high, um, you know, during the rainy season. But it was complete bone dry during the dry season. So it was, it was very unique to see. Um, at that time. Were there any challenges to installing the valve when you got there? Oh, absolutely. So there's obviously the challenge, you know, the, the I guess for my experience, I, mean, there, I, I gained the most of the experiences learning uh, about the culture and the climate and how things work. Um, you know, it was an eye-opening experience for me. Second part was obviously trying to design this water valve and make it appropriate for the people. You know, we use wood, we use, you know, uh, clamps, hose clamps and, and hinges and different things from the U.S., which are very, you know, uh, readily available. But in Africa, it's kind of a different game. So we had to redesign things once we were there and kind of realized what they had locally available. And the final design we came up with actually used a bicycle inner tube. Uh, we knew bikes were readily available and the bicycle inner tube, um, you know, people could get and actually a punched hole, you know, in an in inner tube, we could use that one because we just use a small chunk of the inner tube. And I guess the main concept of the water valve was to connect it in some way, connect the, the bicycle inner tube to the water source. And we had a way of pinching off the, the rubber, you know, causing the water and forming a perfect seal. And we thought the rubber would withstand much, you know, much harsher conditions with it being very dry and sandy, um, especially with the sun that we could, you know, that would work better than these cheap Chinese valves. Every time you open and close, sand gets in them, they, they grind down and start, you know, wearing and tearing and, and losing water. Is there a point where they fail and, and they're able to um, either repair them or to, to remanufacture them? Yeah, so the, the point of the valve, the design was to take something that we know that rubber is obviously going to fail at some time, 
but it's easily replaceable and obviously low cost or technically free for people because it could be abandoned from another bike. So our concept was to take that and utilize that and people could keep repairing it as long as the, the body, we had a big, made of local wood, um, kind of a frame to enc- enclose it and properly seal and unseal the, the rubber. It went through many iterations. We installed it a couple times. You know, we had to build some legs and put it on there, put it on top of the valve. It all depended on each situation was different. We, we installed one. Um, one day went home and we trained some of the local members, just you know, got some user feedback to see how it worked, came back the next day and a donkey hit it and we <laughs> called it the donkey factor. <laughs> uh, something we wouldn't expect obviously in the US sitting at our desk in the US trying to design this, we wouldn't have incorporated a donkey in the design. Well, you know, obviously great learning experience. We kind of noticed that, you know, there are many other conditions that we're not aware of. And so really time will tell how, how well this design works. And so we redesigned it. Unfortunately, now seeing how, how it was, uh, you know, we learned a lot. The design I don't think is still in, in use just because we were unable to get a small enough valve that would hold water and seal properly compared to the existing. And so we realized that, you know, unfortunately our design Although we learned a lot, we don't think it actually ended up being as successful as, as I guess we hoped. How did you go about making the decision to, once you graduated, going into the Peace Corps? Well, um, you know, that was, it was truly a very, very unique uh, situation and a very tough decision. One of the toughest decisions I've made, um, I guess, Getting involved, I had uh, some type of a spark, you know, ignited in me about a year before I graduated, and I found out about some of these awesome classes. This class, for example, Appropriate Senior senior Design. Um, There's also a sustainable engineering course. Um, There's a couple entrepreneurial courses that I started taking and realizing that I could really make a difference with my degree. And so I wanted to take that opportunity. And also I had, you know, a desire to travel and learn and see many other things out there. And so I kind of took a, on a limb of faith, started applying, started talking to people. And, and I actually did the same route as uh, started applying for jobs, you know, the typical engineering route. And so I was kind of stuck in the corner. You know, I had some offers and I started looking down the Peace Corps route. And just one night it kind of hit me. It was like, this is the only time I can do this. It, it, you know, I've, I wouldn't have no other opportunity to do this later in life. Now's the time. And I kind of just dropped all the, the corporate engineering jobs and started full bore applying for the Peace Corps. And after that, um, it just kept getting more and more exciting, kind of learning about what I could be doing abroad and things I could do. Um, That kept me going until I was, uh, I guess, nominated and accepted the offer to serve in Central America. And I guess go there after that. How long of a commitment is that? So the Peace Corps is generally two years and three months. Um, Two years of, of productive service and um, generally three months for a kind of a training, training, cultural training, language training, technical training. Um, so I was nominated to serve as an agricultural Peace Corps volunteer focusing on food security and serving in Nicaragua, Central America. Did you have an opportunity to choose the area of the world? How does that work? Yeah, so Peace Corps, there's uh, a large amount of people applying and there's a large amount of countries that people go and serve. Majority of the volunteers served in Africa. Um, obviously, coming from Africa, I, you know, I really enjoyed my experience, but I really wanted to, one, learn Spanish. I didn't speak any Spanish before. I wanted to learn Spanish. I wanted to focus on and live with rural families. And so uh, speaking with many other of uh, my recruiter and other returned Peace Corps volunteers, I learned that you know, being in a part of the agricultural sector, obviously growing up on a farm, that gave me some good opportunities to learn about that and how I can make a difference. Joining the agricultural sector would give me an opportunity to live very rural areas and live in Central America. And so I did have to petition and try to work hard to get there. And, you know, after some focus and obviously with some of my experiences um, with engineering design, I had, you know, a little bit of extra say and I was nominated to go down to Nicaragua. How long have you been speaking Spanish? Well, (laughs) since day one in Nicaragua. Um, I I think I I took one year in high school. And um, obviously forgot that through the rest of high school and college. Um, so that was obviously very, very tough. But once I got there, it was 100% Spanish. Um, the training that Peace Corps has is one of the best trainings in the world. 
Um, it encompasses a lot of interaction. It's with a Spanish facilitator, Spanish-speaking facilitator, um, a Nicaraguan that spoke very Nicaraguan Spanish. And I think even though she may have spoke a little bit of English, she was prohibited from speaking English. So even my first day, I had, you know, it was kind of um, spelled on what's going on. Um, had my dictionary beside me and, you know, a lot of moving my hands around and acting to figure out what uh, what words meant and pointing different things and how to say them and taking notes. But ultimately, you know, trial by fire, that's the best way to learn. And I live with a host family and I had, there's a couple of younger, a younger boy and a younger girl that I spent with, you know, spent time with in the evenings, talking, pointing to things, writing down my little notebook, what the word meant and practicing things with them. So it was a pretty grueling process, but um, obviously it paid off after three months. Um, we, we, you know, we had class, I had class maybe eight hours a day um, straight and I'd get off, we'd have lunch, I'd talk um, in Spanish, learn different things. We'd have technical Spanish, we'd go and learn technical skills, agricultural skills that were appropriate for Nicaragua, obviously all in Spanish. Um, and it really after the three months, I felt pretty comfortable going and living by myself and I guess speaking conversationally to, to Nicaraguans to at least kind of start building relationships. Wow. Would you gauge yourself now as uh, like a fluent expert speaker or would you call yourself an intermediate? What do you, what do you say? Yeah, well, so I learned, I mean, um, I guess the, f the fluent term is, is used loosely. So yes, fluent where I can speak very well. I can understand 99% everything. And if I don't, I know how to ask to understand 100%. But on the technical scale, yes, I'm actually an intermediate uh, advanced, I believe. There's actually a, a language scale. So I'm, I'm up there. Fluent is, you know, fluent. It's the highest level. And so I'm not there. Um, I doubt I'll ever get there. And that's, you know, very, very tough and something that I know right now I'm, I'm more than adequate to speak um, as much as I need to. So it was an amazing experience. And obviously, after a year of speaking, um, I felt very, very comfortable. And, you know, the three months I felt comfortable enough to speak. But after a year, I was I felt awesome. I could speak with anybody. I had built up great relationships. And ultimately, that's kind of a good sign. You know, you realize that without speaking, if you, without understanding people, um, you know, you, it's so hard to build up a relationship, you know, of friendships. And so I had a lot of younger people in my village, but I couldn't get to know them because I couldn't speak the language until after the first year. Then I felt really awesome. We had a lot of good jokes. And by joking, you know, you really know how the language. Wow, that's that's I'm, I'm impressed. I mean, a year is uh, that's pretty fast, I think. Uh, well, thanks. But like, like I said, but that's the only thing I spoke. Um, I did get a, a break to um, talk to people in the U.S. and other volunteers um, speaking English. But like I said, primarily the best way to learn. Um, it would have taken me ten years to do to learn Spanish from the U.S. So obviously, living in in country is is super super important and really helped aid in the process. Describe what it was like there living in Nicaragua. Yeah. So. Uh, a beautiful country, one of the most beautiful countries I've ever been in, and it's a land of lakes and volcanoes. They have two huge lakes in the middle of the country. Um, they have over 23 volcanoes that run right down from north to south, um, a couple of them very active, a couple of them dormant. Obviously, borders uh, Costa Rica on the north and Honduras in the south. It's one of the largest countries in Central America, the poorest country in Central America, and actually the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Um, right behind Haiti. Um, so an average income, people uh, make about $2 a day. So mind you, this isn't, people aren't, you know, majority of these of uh, Nicaraguans are farmers or rural family members. Um, they don't receive a $2 check in the mail every day. You know, they live off of subsistence farming. So they have the same kind of, um, depending on the area, but they, you know, have six months of rain and six months of dry season. And during the rainy season, they can get up to two or three crops in so we're here in the U.S., you know, and farmers in Iowa, we can plant corn and you plant, you know, at the beginning of the spring and you harvest in the fall. Um, there they actually can get in two seasons of corn or beans or millet, um, some of the main staple crops. And, um, you know, they invest a lot, almost all of their money into buying the seed and they plant and they harvest. And then right after the harvest season, they have a little excess money that they use to buy extra goods and save up and they save up the grain um, and that's their form of currency and obviously sell a little bit of grain when they need to buy something or buy more food and and live off of that like i said the main crops the majority of the more majority of the nicaraguans are farmers and it's a very safe it's one of the safest countries in central america and like i said it was just uh the experience that i had in nicaragua uh, the people there are so amazing 
Um, they would have so little. I'd be walking, you know, through a random village that I didn't know up in the mountains and people would stop and say hi and talk to me, invite me in and give me a plate of beans and rice. And, you know, they have so little, but they're still offering, you know, this, this plate and this gesture of coming into their home, the hospitality. That was something that truly irreplaceable. What were the projects that you were working on there? So I went down in the agricultural sector, um, obviously being an engineer and loving engineering um, since I was young, um, I really wanted to focus and, and use that engineering degree. And so I focused on egg agricultural products and with rural families. And I started actually designing, redesigning or learning about technologies that have been installed or implemented in developing countries. Um, so I just did a lot of research, talking to different people, understanding the, you know, what's available in Nicaragua. Same kind of concept and same kind of the um, process that I did in Mali. Just learning what's there, what's available, and, and uh, I guess what kind of needs people have and what kind of resources they have. Um, so it's not all about what do you want, what do you want. It's more like what kind of resources do you have available, what opportunities, and how can we make your life easier, save time, potentially help people generate income, or improve the environment. So I started tinkering with a lot of different technologies. Um, one of the first ones was an improved oven. So there's a design that was already designed. So not reinventing the wheel, but kind of learning about it and how to, learning how to improve it. Um, we utilized a metal barrel. And what you would do is you would fabricate the metal barrel, cut the top, put some hinges on it, basically make a door, and then put a rack on the inside of the metal barrel and set the barrel horizontal and build kind of a little house around the barrel with bricks. And um, you would you could you would light a fire underneath the barrel, it would heat up the barrel, fire would pass on both sides of the barrel and exit out the top, and on the inside you could put baked goods. So this design kind of replaces their traditional oven, which is very similar to what they had in Africa, but is more of a, a mud shaped igloo that people would burn fire on the inside, heat up the inside, and when it was you know the fire was hot enough, they push the fire off the side, put the baked goods inside, and it would bake. Well, this kind of took place of that. Now where you can put the baked goods inside of the barrel and the heat would be on the outside of the barrel and it would improve um, obviously the flavor. There's not a smoky flavor and the efficiency was over 90% 90, 90 more efficient, these improved ovens. So after learning how these worked, tinkering with it, I installed one in my community and saw how much the people loved them. They absolutely loved it. They they Before when baking was was a task they did, now it was a task they loved. People gathered around these ovens. I built one in, in the central main area, a common, common area in my community. And people joined around. Uh, most of the women would get together, and we actually started a bakery. So every, twice a week, we started once a week with a group of, I think there was eight or nine women. We would meet once a week, and we would bake. And it was just a good social outlet. And then it started going to two times a week. We'd, we'd all meet, we'd bake, we all bring some flour, um, some millet flour or corn flour or, or wheat flour, mix it up and add sugar and different things and make baked goods um, and pastels or, or I guess, I uh, can't think of the word, cake, some types of very simple cake. So a uh, long story short is this, this technology that was kind of a concept we, you know, we implemented in our community and then I got other community members involved and had kind of had focus groups and understanding how the technology worked and also how can we improve it to make it better. So what, what could we do to make it easier for them? What kind of heights, what kind of changes, alterations could we make that use mo more local materials or um, made it easier for them to use or else uh, made it more efficient to burn firewood? Wow, very impressive. It was an amazing experience, and it was awesome to have that, you know, that friendship and, uh, built up with the community and having everybody involved and, you know, around this, this awesome technology. So anybody out there thinking about joining the Peace Corps, what advice would you have for them? Do it. Uh, it's a very tough decision. You know, it's, very, it's a very unique road to take, but it's something that changed my life for the better. Um, it opened up so many different opportunities for me. Um, I learned so much about myself so much about the world and really I learned a ton more about the U.S. and how the world thinks of the U.S. Um, it was very unique for me being in Central America. You know, people looked up to, to America, um, to the United States as just a dream world. Um, you know, it's where everybody's dreams, you know, happen. It was just, it was very unique to hear that when I see that people in Nicaragua sometimes are even happier with less, with little, with the 
the simple joys of, you know, some very um, simple humor that people would have. And people were just, you know, constant joy being around family and friends and people in the U.S. to get caught up with insurance and taxes and different things. And so it was a very, it was very unique to kind of eye-opening experience to see that, um, you know, what true happiness is. Tell me about the genesis of EOS. So, um, backtrack until my senior year of college when, uh, when I was in the middle of the senior design course, um, Greg McGrath, um, another founder of EOS, uh, Chris Deal, another mechanical engineer, and then Lee Beck, um, an egg and food science major. Um, the four of us uh, met a couple times. We had a crazy idea over a couple of keystone lights talking about what we can do with our lives. Very open, no idea what we wanted to do. But no, we wanted to kind of use our skills to make a difference. And so these conversations started um, just very general, you know, bringing in ideas, some discussions, some contacts and books that we read, or articles. And these meetings, we kept having these meetings on a weekly basis until we started coming up with the idea that we wanted to create kind of a business plan to kind of set forth what, what we wanted EOS to do. And obviously, you know, we created a name, EOS, Emerging Opportunities for Sustainability, and then we... Um, wanted to make a difference with technology in the developing world. We wrote a small business plan, actually applied for a grant from Iowa State and won $2,000 from the Papa John um, scholarship. And that set us going into an opportunity that now we have an idea, we have some small funding, um, we can really make this happen. And that was coinciding with my time that I was looking into doing the Peace Corps um, this served as an awesome vehicle to kind of take the concept and idea of EOS of using technology and really make it happen in, in the country where I would serve. Um, on the flip side, Greg McGrath stayed in the U.S. and started working for General Mills, but he built up EOS from the organizational standpoint, looking into understanding how we become a 501c3 status organization or official nonprofit, applying for, with the IRS. Um, setting up our bylaws, setting up all the rules and, I guess, regulations, things to get, you know, get us formalized in the U.S. This is all happening while I was down in Nicaragua, understanding what technologies we wanted to use. And obviously, we'd have phone calls and I would actually get other engineers involved. And, you know, I'd say, hey, we wanted to learn, I want to learn and um, install a drip irrigation system. Um, and so they did a lot of research in the U.S. and sent me a bunch of information, um, packets and, and articles about how to install a drip irrigation system. And with that support, I was able to install a drip irrigation system. So it kind of came up with an idea of utilizing, you know, technology to make a difference. And throughout the two years, I was able to really define what technologies really make a difference, how these technologies make a difference, and how do we promote and basically implement these technologies, um, again, to make a positive impact in, in the lives of, for now, Nicaraguans. How many people work for EOS? So right now, we have nine full-time Nicaraguan uh, engineers, um, accountants, and business managers uh, working in-country. Uh, and we also have in the U.S., we have about 12 volunteers, all volunteers based throughout. We have people out in California, in Colorado, Montana, Florida, California, or Colorado, I already said that, uh, Chicago, um, even out east. So we have people throughout the whole parts. Um, our board of directors is a very diverse board. But obviously, all very dedicated to the to the vision and mission of EOS of uh, making a difference, and it's it's been awesome to have such an amazing supportive team. Wes, what's your role in EOS? How often do you get to Nicaragua? So I get to Nicaragua every six to twelve months. Obviously, coming back from Nicaragua, I came back in two thousand ten, um, so it was a couple years ago now. I was um, I was going back about every six months. Um, and then now with a full-time job, uh, you know, I'm, I try to make it back. I was back every eight months now and always trying to get back there, never back there enough. Um, my role is has continued to be managing the Nicaraguan operations. So overseeing the projects that we're doing, um, working with our team, we have a country director, Alvaro, who manages the whole team, the eight other um, employees, um, you know, consisting of a coordinator. We have accountants. And, um, and technicians, which are basically, you know, getting their hands dirty and really making, installing the technologies and really making the difference. And so kind of according with them, strategically setting plans, setting goals, approving budgets, trying to wonder how we're managing things and continue down the, the path to make the biggest difference, the biggest impact um, with 
the amount of resources that we have, which um, mostly primarily come from donors right now. How many volunteers work for EOS? Um, we have uh, dedicated, we have about 12 um, dedicated volunteers. We have maybe uh, up to 20, 25, which are kind of on the outskirts that provide support, you know, offers services here and there. Um, but we have about 12 that are dedicated almost on, for sure, on a weekly basis, sometimes even on a daily basis that are, that are working. Can you ever get enough volunteers? No, not at all. So we are, um, you know, and the cool thing is our volunteers are actually specialists. Um, we have technology specialists, we have designing specialists, we have marketing specialists. And so we, you know, we've really searched out and one found friends and family members and contacts who have, you know, a passion to make a difference. And that's the big, that's the biggest and most important thing. But beyond that, you know, the skills that we have found from different people have been phenomenal in, in helping us take EOS to where it is now and to the next step. Finding new ways, you know, starting off, you know, not having many resources and being as a, you know, a simple nonprofit, it's hard to find these resources, but getting, you know, specialists involved. Um, super important. We're definitely always looking for more help uh, from people and, you know, very motivated people because sometimes we, you know, give somebody a task and, and they go ahead and take it from, you know, start to finish and implement it. And so it's kind of cool to see a lot of the things, obviously everything we've done in the U.S. has been from volunteers and, you know, definitely always looking for more. You mentioned the oven, you mentioned drip, irriga- drip irrigation. What are some of the other projects that EOS has going on in, in Nicaragua? Yes, we have uh, an awesome design called a biogas digester. It's a fairly simple design utilizing a big plastic bag um, that we bury in the ground and we add cow manure to. We use a cow manure, but it can use any organic material. Um, you insert the cow manure on one side and it decomposes and produces methane. And since it's in a big, large plastic bag, we can capture the methane and actually pipe it into the kitchen with just a half inch PVC pipe. And pipe it in the kitchen. We hook it into the back side of an um, actual gas burner stove, just like we have in the U.S. And we turn the valve open, and we have a flame of gas. And it is, it, it's odor-free. Um, it looks just like a gas stove, and it cooks just like a gas stove. And so this is an amazing technology where um, really you're, you're putting in cow manure, and you're getting out methane. And the total system design is something around $100 and $150. But people, if people make the investment, they can pay for it within eight months. Again, utilizes all local materials. The plastic is locally available, PVC. You know, we have a pressure relief valve. So if the pressure, if the gas were to build up, uh, we have a really simple design utilizing a, a pot bottle and a water and a, and a tea tube. Um, very simple, again, very appropriate, and something that really makes sense for Nicaragua. Uh, we have a really awesome design that we we did not invent, but we are implementing from another partner organization called Compatible Technologies, and they're actually based up in Minnesota. And they they came up, they developed the design of a water coordinator to be used for community sized water systems. Um, so we have taken this design. It utilizes PVC, and you basically can control the amount of water that's diverted that flows over a chlorine tablet, and you can regulate and calibrate the amount of chlorine that's inserted into the community water system and where people, um, existing systems would would include a pipe that's piped up to really high stream up in the mountains. Um, Sometimes I've seen these pipes piped up to seven miles long to get to a a nice fresh stream of water up in the mountains and then utilizes gravity to feed the water into a tank and then the water tank is distributed in, in smaller pipes to homes, maybe a couple valves near the homes, so people can have access to relatively clean water. One of the issues we have is that clean water may look clean, but obviously it can contain a lot of bacteria. And if there is a cow that had manure up in the stream or contaminated the stream with dirt or heavy rains, obviously that bacteria would travel through the stream, through the pipe, all the way down to the valve. Um, so people would be drinking that, even though it may look clean. So the important thing is that a lot of training goes into this. But by utilizing this, this new water chlorinator device um, called the CTI-8, we can now chlorinate water for the whole community because all the water would pass through this water chlorinator, go into the tank, and disinfect all the bacteria, providing people with clean water. And so this has been one of our most important technologies. Um, providing clean water is so important to people. Some really cool stat, I was just in Nicaragua last February, and we were visiting one of the departments. It's called the MINSA, or the Ministry of Health. We were meeting with one of the directors in the department, and she commented in one of the department, and one of her, I guess, 
the equivalent of a county um, in that department, they had reported in the year 2011, they had 14 deaths, uh, mostly children, from dehydration due to diarrhea. And the, then she said in the year 2012, they had only four. And the reason that she put to this was because people now had access to clean water, where they now were getting clean water, didn't have as much bacteria, and people's lives, you know, people were not, little babies, you know, I had clean water to drink and, you know, basically saving these children's lives. And obviously there's other parts to it, there's other, you know, characteristics, but the water, clean water is at the very forefront of that. And that was just an amazing experience for me to understand that and really kept the, the fire going for us to keep promoting um, and getting this installed in, in as many parts of Nicaragua as we can. We only, we've only installed only 100 and, 100 and some uh, water coordinators, and there's over 5,000 community water systems. So obviously we're working on, on getting there, but uh, we've been doing this for about a year and a half, and we have a long ways to go. Well, congratulations. Those are great achievements. Thank you. We have an awesome team, like I said. They, they've they been doing an amazing job, and they've been doing it. They deserve all the credit. What's next for EOS? What's next for EOS? Well, we are always continue looking into new technologies, um, and actually we're working on a new cycle of promotion. Um, it's kind of unique. As I said, we have a team of nine, and we're working in one, you know, in, in the northern part of Nicaragua. But obviously getting to rural areas is very tough. Um, it's very difficult, you know, filling up, you know, putting gas in our truck or taking motorcycles to get out to these communities, you know, it takes hours and hours to get there. And that limits us in the amount of people that we can help. So we're kind of implementing a cycle promotion. And what this cycle does is that we, we focus on trying to find a community leader in one of the communities. We find a new community, find a community leader. And this community leader, you know, is interested. Um, somebody may, maybe a little bit more educated, maybe has taken a couple more risks, may have a little bit nicer home than other people in the community, but people respect them. And we, we get one of our technologies in their hands, install it in their home, let them experiment with it, touch it, see it, you know, understand how well it works, be it an oven, be it a biogas digester, a drip irrigation system. And after they see it, then family members, community members come by and they understand it and they like it. And then we come back to visit the community and we find out that other, more people would like this technology. So we come back, bring materials, and now we take the community leader with us to the new person's home and install a second technology in the community. And the community leader has access. He installed the first one in his home and now he sold it for his friend. We do that a couple of times until the community leader has installed three or four of these technologies and becomes a local expert. So now we can take this technology and basically give it to the community leader and the community leader can install it in the community and it serves as a cycle, a sustainable cycle, where all the technologies we can provide them with and the knowledge stays within the community. So if there's troubleshooting, they would go to the community leader. If other people want it, they can go to the community leader. We can provide the community leader with materials um, that we can fabricate. We can buy in bulk and prepare and send to them at a much cheaper rate. And, and this is a new method that we're trying to really promote because it will save us in a lot of time and energy. Obviously, it takes a little bit more effort up front, but it can really make a bigger difference in the end. Wes, tell me about the Statement Maker honor that was awarded to you from Iowa State University. How did that come about? Um, I believe I was nominated, and it was uh, an amazing honor. Um, I believe it's, it's you know, of, of alumni, younger alumni, um, who's done something in the community. And I guess it was, it was a friend, a contact that I had, a friend at, at a church that I attended, St. Thomas Aquinas in Ames. And, um, you know, she was really, uh, I guess, impressed with some of the things that I was doing. And so she nominated me for my work. And um, I guess I was selected as one of the uh, one of the statement makers for the year. How do you find out about that? Um, I was uh, I guess I was notified by uh, one of the alumni members, um, the alumni association members. And, you know, they congratulated me and, and sent us a report and bi- biography of um, all the other members. And I was able to learn about some of the awesome things that other other students and other young alumni are doing throughout throughout the world. Hey, congratulations. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate it. What's next for you? Well, um, continuing to work on, on projects with EOS, continuing to develop my skills with international development. There's so many other opportunities. There's so many things out there and so many people to help. And so, you know, really learning more, getting more people involved with EOS. Um, obviously, fundraising is super important for us. Um, you know, we're utilizing these these 
funds in, in a very efficient manner and, you know, helping to impact more and more Nicaraguans. And so really it's building EOS, building it to the next level. Right now, like I said, we have all volunteers in the U.S. Um, our hope is in the next couple of years we can get a couple paid people in the U.S. to really take EOS to the next level. And obviously continuing to visit Nicaragua. And, you know, we are always looking to going to, into different countries in Central America, at least to start out. Um, the goal is in the world, but obviously being very strategic and very smart with our money, it makes sense to focus in one area and really make a big impact before we, you know, spread out to other areas. Wes, if people out there want to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Well, um, email, uh, Facebook, uh, phone. Um, my, I guess my, my email account is Wesley, W-E-S-L-E-Y dot Meyer, M-E-I-E-R at E-O-S-I-N-T-L dot org. Um, Facebook, um, check out our website, um, type in EOS International on the Facebook account. Um, we also have a, a website, www.eosintl.org. Um, we have a ton of information. We're always daily posting updates from our team, pictures, and you know, always looking for people to get involved and kind of see if you're interested in donating. You can really see where your money goes and really makes a positive impact in, in Nicaragua. Wes Meyer, thank you so much for talking to me today, and uh, thank you for telling your story, and good luck to you and EOS uh, in the future. Thank you so much, Paul. It's been a pleasure being on the show. Recorded May 8, 2013.